We've been dealing with, we began last week with the treasure. Um, we've dealt with uh, the treasure that he has placed within earthen vessels, according to Paul. And uh, as he dealt with uh, the verse of scripture, given the description, 2 Corinthians 4, 7, we have this treasure in earthen vessels with the excellency of power may be of God and not of us. And we just kind of went and worked at it, you know, realizing there is treasure with inside each and every one of us. And Ecclesiastes, NIV version, says that he has placed eternity in the heart of man. And that with inside of us, that's the reason why even the American dream doesn't uh, fulfill us. You, you can climb the ladder of success and still find an emptiness because there is eternity with inside of your heart. And the only thing that's going to be able to answer that cry is the eternal works of God. There's eternity place. There's treasure with inside. And the way to tap into this treasure, this is what we've been dealing with. We're tapping in to the treasure that God's placed. And it's not a self-help sermon. This is not a you know, the, the, the great you, you know, it's not about that. But as we dealt with, even in the life of Peter, uh, he used to be called Simon, so he started walking with Jesus. And Jesus took the fisherman and, and changed him into the fisher of men. He said, I'll no longer call you Simon, but I'm going to call you Peter. And, and he took the, this amazing, uh, uh, well, if you judge him by the cover, book by the cover, it wouldn't have been so amazing. He was a cursing sailor or fisherman, and uh, he really... We didn't see him catching too many fish in Scripture either. So even though it was his business, it might have been struggling. Maybe it was. Maybe it wasn't. I don't know. But, but we do know that he turned him into a world changer. And it's only because that as he walked with Jesus, Jesus called the treasure route that was in there. All along that he never realized it was there. And there's treasure with inside of you that you have yet to tap into. And as we walk hand in hand with Jesus, it begins to unfold. He draws a treasure out with inside of us. He begins to unfold the different things that God has deposited with inside of us. Even while we are in our, uh, our mother's womb. Can I hear an amen? amen. Even while we are in our mother's womb, he, he deposited, he formed us, he created us. And he's got treasure with inside of you. Turn to your neighbor and tell him that you're more valuable than I realized. That's right. And you can answer back, I know. That's it. That's good. <laughs> In Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, it says, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And it's, it's easy to find, as Jesus was kind of given some description, you look into your checking book, your, your budgeting on your online baking, you can see where your treasure is at. You can find out. I mean, talk is cheap. You can say what you treasure, but you really pay for your greatest treasure. And this is the reason why <clears throat> secular, uh, the secular world has caught on to this a lot greater uh, oftentimes than what the church has as they've started from Nickelodeon, from the time as uh, young uh, as, as babies on up through uh, Disney and Disney XD, you got MTV, and they've done all these uh, medias, created all these outlets to disciple them. Um, and it's not just to persuade the direction and the choices they make, which it's a part of it, but they also know that's where your treasure is at. When's the last time you went to see a movie just for yourself? When was the last time you went to see a lame, boring, dumb movie because your children or your grandchildren wanted to see it? That's what I'm talking about. That seems to be where, where our treasures Or there's the other people where maybe you ought to spend a little bit more focus on your children and you don't have that as your treasure. You know, it's, it's, there's different people that are sitting in here. But I, I think a lot of us, you can find easily, look at your checkbook, you can see, not just by what you tell me, I can show you where your treasure is because that's where your heart is. Where do you spend your money? What is it that it goes, uh, goes directly into? And, and so what we're dealing with here is the treasure, the treasure that we have uh, with inside of us, the treasure that we have. A lot of times we belittle uh, what we have. We think what we have is not enough. I don't know if you've ever felt like that before. Um, uh, if you feel like what you have is not enough, if you've ever felt like I'm uh, I, don't, I just don't know. Uh, you feel intimidated by thinking what you have is not enough, and so you never really want to give that much. Or you see other people, and you think they have more to offer to give than what you do. But we can find in Scripture that, that Jesus brings a description to that as, you know what? 
I recognize even the widow's mite. To you, you may think it's really not that much, but I see, not even in the amount that is given, but he sees and he holds us accountable to what we have. And he never really asks us to give more than what we have. He's always just looking to see what you do have. And that's all he's asking for. <laughs> you know, uh, and, and so maybe other people might have more, but that's not the amount of the gift that impresses God. And it, we see this, Jesus is watching people giving into the offering. He draws out and he said, this woman here, this widow with her two mites, she actually gave more than everybody else. He sees and he knows and we're held accountable or responsible to literally what we do with what's in our hands. Now, we all have different types of treasure. Last week, we dealt with a stupid cardboard with a uh, little square with a baseball player's face on it, and, and people can pay a lot of money for baseball cards, different treasures. Some treasures you'll find in their garage as, as people or guys specifically like to probably have a project in their garage, and they've got their, their, uh, their car that they love, that they take care of, that they wax, that they wash, that they clean. You can... Tell that's not my treasure if you ever see my car. That, but, but we all have our different treasures that, that we have to each our own. Um, you know, Jesus speaks about, you know, the different types of treasure, those that rust, those that the moths eat up, and the importance of what real treasure is all about. And this brings us to what we're going to go to today in Luke chapter 7. In Luke chapter 7, I don't want to focus in because... Uh, we, we speak about this, I, I think, often. It's such a powerful portion of Scripture. And we find that Jesus was invited into this Pharisee's house. And in Luke chapter 7, they sit down to eat. And this is, you know, verse 36 kind of speaks about uh, him going into the house. They sit down to eat. And then verse 37, everything changes. And it says, and behold, a woman in the city which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at me in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him, weeping and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and the kiss, kissed his feet and anointed them with ointment. And now when the Pharisee, which had bidden him, saw it, they spake within him, saying, uh, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known uh, who and what manner of woman this is that touched him, for she is a sinner. Can you believe the goal? <laughs> and so we find that this woman comes into this gathering at the Pharisee's house. She did not get the invite. Besides the invitation... She didn't wait for it, and she, maybe you say barges in, or definitely enters in. And as she comes, you'll find out as you continue to read in a couple different uh, of the Gospels that speak about it, but as she comes in, it actually began to offend the Pharisees. There's an offense to it, not just because of what type of woman she was, but it's a costly ointment that she brought in. She brought something, and, and by the way, I'm glad that it just said sinner in a general theme because I can relate to that. I can relate to the description of this woman was a sinner. There are those that have different arguments, what they believe or perceive, whether she was, uh, whether she was a prostitute, whether she was one caught in adultery, whether she was all these, and, and maybe those are valid. Maybe that's who she was. Maybe that's what she did for a living. I don't know. We do know that her, her reputation was large enough that it preceded her. <laughs> we do know that she was a, a good sinner. <laughs> she was a professional sinner there, to the point that when she walked in, they knew who she was because of her sin. So we do know that. She was a sinner. And, and one thing about it is that that even though that she was that sinner, she had to know that when she walked into the room, this is what would be spoken about her. This is what would be thought about her. This is what they would be whispering behind the, you know, behind their, underneath their breath. And what I love is in spite of her reputation or in spite of what others thought about her, she did not let that stop her from getting to Jesus. 
And a lot of times we let all these ideas or thoughts or uh, insecurities of what other people think on what we do in our life. And, and I love that, that she didn't allow that to happen because, and the reality is, um, you know, she didn't come for them anyways. She didn't come for them. She didn't come to please them. She didn't come to, you know, impress them. She came for one reason, and she comes through this door uninvited, and she comes prepared. She didn't just come um, just offhandedly, but she came prepared. She was bringing something. She was on mission. She had something that was so costly, something that, that was precious and you know, especially in that day, maybe more precious than in this day. Like, for instance, I know perfume is an amazing gift, just not when you get it for every anniversary, birthday, and Christmas. <laughs> Guys sometimes could use a little bit of help. Um, so I'm not speaking. Let's not try to define it by what we go through because that seems to be a great common gift that us guys can get away with getting for girls until you see that the shelf is lined up with last year's perfume. And anyways, that's not the case for her. If she was, uh, regardless of her occupation, she used that money to buy this ointment and, and it, it had a beautiful fragrance to it. And especially if she was a sinner with a bad reputation, she already had different types of insecurities. For a woman, a woman likes to smell good. <laughs> I got more amens from the guys when I said that. that, that <laughs> maybe I should have said, men, we love our women to smell good. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. So ladies love to smell good. It makes them feel better about themselves. Especially if you live in a Middle Eastern culture with no deodorant, it was even that much more priceless, precious, that much more valuable, at least to the lady that owned it. And she came prepared. And as she walks through this door, she offends the religious. Even those that were following Jesus were kind of questioning what was going on, and she brings a gift, and a lot of times, as you sit and look at the picture in the scripture in this moment, you find that Jesus is sitting there uh, at this house with those that invited him and those that follow him, and they're all there, and in this picture, I would love to say that I am like this woman that, that is has done this, has been able to bring something to Jesus' feet, but more often than I would like to admit, I find myself as one of those that are sitting at the table, one of those that, that in that tradition of their culture, it was common courtesy. It was just the tradition of the day that there was a bowl to wash somebody's feet, especially since you invited them. It'd be one thing if Jesus just stopped by, like a Zacchaeus we talked about last week, said, I'm coming to your house. But that's not the case. The Pharisee invited Jesus into his house. At least he could have done was have the common courtesy to do the tradition of the day. And yet that did not happen. He didn't, he, he didn't get his feet washed, and, and you, in that day, you greeted each other with a kiss. That didn't even happen. And far too often, we find ourselves, not as the woman bringing her heart to Jesus' feet, but one that is sitting at the table, almost just going through the same old, same old, maybe stuck in a routine, almost at that place to where... Um, Jesus is there, and he's not even really getting the common courtesy on what she deserves. Taking his presence for granted. I find myself seated at that table far too uh, more than I would like to admit. And going to the place where you go through the same old, same old, going through the motions. You go to church. You fight with the kids to get them to church. You fight with your spouse and where to eat after church. You go, and you're having this great time as a family seeking God. You're going, and... And, and you're singing the songs, and now we get to the place, well, you know, we'll enter into the presence of God if it's our song. Don't you dare sing a song I don't like. And I'm going to sit there with my arms crossed and a frown on my face. Or, or you know, may, if they, you know you, or just you're going through the song, and you're singing the song, and you're singing the words, but you're not worshiping. Come on. You're just singing a song. It's going through the motions. It's, 
It's when you lift up your hands and you're worshiping and tears begin to come down your cheek. Not because you're a crybaby, not because uh, you're just that way emotional, but when the presence of God happens, it turns the greatest Harley rider, bear of a man, into a teddy bear. <laughs> That's the presence of God. And so it's where you're not going through the routine, same old, same old, of singing those songs just because you know the words, but you're actually worshiping. Why? Because it's not because you had the perfect week, but because you're taking advantage of a perfect moment and saying, God, regardless of my week, I'm giving you my heart. Oh, man, maybe it's not my favorite song. Maybe they've sung it over and over for the tenth time. But, God, I am telling you what, I love you right now. I love you so much. And worship begins to happen. You step out of the same old, same old. You step out of the routine. And I'm not going to take them for granted. These are some of the things that we all find ourselves falling into if we're not careful. And we see that these guys are sitting around. And, you know, the reality is it would have been fine. No one would have even have noticed anything until this woman comes in. It takes a woman sometimes. You ladies are really lame on backing me up in this message this morning. I say you want to smell good. I didn't get nothing. I say it takes a woman sometimes, and you're just. Let me get back to my notes. It takes sometimes a woman to walk through that door and ruffle all the feathers. Jesus didn't even speak up in this moment. Jesus wasn't sitting there going, I'm offended. You hurt my feelings. My feet are not washed. None of that was even brought up until they raised their ugly heads and started murmuring and complaining over this woman that came in uninvited. And the thing is, they didn't even say it out loud. We didn't read that yet, but I'm trying to help you out so it's not an hour and a half. I was joking when I originally said that for those that are visiting. It was, it was a joke. Um, <laughs> you never know once you come into a church, right? But later you'll find that I didn't even read that far, but they, oh, I, I did read that part. It said they begin to say within themselves. It was verse 39 said, he spake within himself, saying, this man, if he were a prophet. And that was his mistake right there. And in the early service, I kind of went into, it's why Jesus is so much better than myself. Um, because they didn't even say anything, right? They didn't, put, they didn't put words to their thoughts. And this is why I pray on a regular basis, God, please, Touch the meditations of my heart and my thoughts, God. Because it's bad enough. I'm pretty good on what comes out of my mouth. I think I got a pretty good filter. <laughs> I, I, I think I'm, I do. I really, I'm, I'm proud to say that I think I'm pretty good in that area. <laughs> Some people say things. <laughs> Some people just don't have a, the smart filter that's on there. No, don't look around. Some people have just, they're just not too bright. And um, maybe it's not what you put with words. Maybe some people are not too bright on what they're typing on Facebook. It's just like, it's, you, you so need to just shut up, please. It's, it's bad. Please. It, 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 it's like, and, and Jesus didn't have to hear any words but he picked up what's on their heart, and he's saying if he was a prophet, he would know what manner of woman this is if he was a prophet. And, and in that moment, I would have, if I was Jesus, I, I, oh, man, I almost did something. Someone didn't take their communion this morning. I was getting ready to do a, an example of what I was going to do. is going to get a lot worse. But if I was Jesus and I was sitting there in that moment and, I picked up in a prophetic moment of what they were thinking. I totally would have just stood up 
throw the things around, kick the tables, lash out, and say, I'll show you a prophet. You want to know what a prophet is? Listen here, buddy. You sinned last night at 3 o'clock. No, I, yeah, I would have I, I wanted to rip into a good one. But that's not what Jesus did. In his mercy, he brings out this parable and leads them through this track of creditors and who owed and what was owed to the creditors and who was forgiven and how much was forgiven much. And, and Jesus in his mercy even raising up. And in the beauty of it, he said, you know what, you idiot? I'm not a prophet. I'm the Messiah. So, you know, uh, anyways, he, he, but Jesus didn't do that. He leads them in his mercy through a parable to try to open up. And it wasn't because they said anything with his mouth. He didn't have to say a thing. And he picked up in the spirit what he was thinking in his heart. Lord, help us to have hearts, God, that bring you pleasure. Let our thoughts and our meditations of our heart be pleasing to you, O oh God. Amen. Lord, let it be a place to, I mean, talk is cheap anyways. It even says in Scripture where they are actually quoting Isaiah where he said, with your lips you draw close to me, but your heart is far from me. It, it, it's one of those things. And, and, and Jesus didn't have to even try to bring definition, but he did. He, did he, he brought out this parable. He leads them in his mercy. And, and then he begins to give the description to what's going on. Now back to this woman. She, didn't, she came prepared. She brought something. I think one of the reasons that, help, uh, that keeps us from falling into a routine of the same old, same old is if you really want to stay in a place where you're not so comfortable of taking them for granted, then you have to be in a place that things still cost you something. This woman came with costly, the alabaster box and the ointment was costly. Too often we come in and we don't even really, you know, uh, and again, this isn't just about offering, right? I, I, we purposely take the offering after that so you don't think I'm like shaking the bucket in front of you that you need to give more. It's not the case because we know that what we're talking about this morning is things that money can't even buy anyways. It's something that the money, it's, it doesn't even equate to what we're dealing with. We're talking about this treasure that she brings, and it did cost her something. David realized, I'm not going to give to God something that costs me nothing. There is a cost involved of this exchange. It's a cost. You see, the woman kind of represents the person that just got saved, one of the new believers in the church. Well, you've been there in church for years, and here they're coming in. Their prayers are being answered. They're bringing friends in, getting friends saved, and, and why is God always answering their prayer? Why are they so excited? All they talk about is Jesus. I mean, I mean, it's okay to talk about the Cardinals or the Rams once in a while, but do you have to talk about Jesus all the time? Yeah, come on. <laughs> you know, but, but in her mind, she doesn't care about the talk of the day. Jesus is in the house. Her heart is captivated and captured. And Jesus brings out this parable for a reason, and he ends the parable by saying, to whom much is forgiven, loves much. And so we do see a major key. How do you have a heart that's so passionate, that goes into the uninvited places, regardless of what they think or say about you, because you're not there for them, and you pour out something that costs you. Pouring out something that costs Living a life that, God, there is a place of a living sacrifice, that I don't get so caught up in a routine Christian walk that I no longer give you anything that doesn't cost me. And some of the things that cost more is time. Time is so valuable in these days. We've talked about this plenty of times. Everybody's busy these days. Even the people that don't do anything are busy doing nothing. Everybody's busy, and time is valuable. And so what is the time? Time is not just a couple hours on a Sunday to say, God, there I gave you my, here's my due diligence. This woman said, I'm going to give you something that costs me something. And it's in this that we find a heart that breaks open. And, and that was another thing. She didn't just open it and pour it. I mean, this was broken. You couldn't put it back together. It was something that was meant just for Jesus. And, you know, I don't know if you've ever been in those times with God where you started thanking God or, or you started just pouring out uh, your love to God and all of a sudden you start crying more than you thought you were going to cry. Sometimes his presence, he hits you and all of a sudden, you know, before you know it, you're weeping 
and you weren't prepared, otherwise you would have had Kleenexes, you know, those moments. I don't know if that's what her moment was like. I mean, she was coming. She came prepared to give. But as she began to weep and those tears began to fall and splash upon his feet, she lets her hair down. When was the last time that you let your hair down in the place of worship at his feet? When was the last time? And, and I don't know. Maybe she came into the room and maybe, maybe she came to give him a gift noticing that no one had washed his feet. Noticing that uh, regardless of whatever was going on, maybe she didn't even know she wasn't there at that time. I don't know, but she did come in. And her heart's being poured out more so than the alabaster box that was broken. And as she's pouring out this love and this passion, Jesus gives us a key into this moment. And he says, to whom much is forgiven, loves much. And I think one of the other things that keeps us from falling into a rut of going through the same old, same old, is not forgetting where he's brought you from. Not forgetting what he's brought you out of because if you've sat in this table long enough, you almost think you've deserved it or you've earned it. Or, you know, you've dotted all of your I's, you've crossed all your T's and you think you're a pretty good person and you've forgotten of where you've come from and in essence now you're taking for granted his grace and his presence but not this sinner woman. She was too fresh of a sinner. Her reputation was still strong. And as she barges, barges through this door and begins to say thank you, tears are welling up, going, falling from her face and onto his feet. She's wiping his feet, washing his feet, not with a basin of water, but with her very own tears. There's a lot of tears that have been shed in our lifetime. There's a lot of tears through different things that you go through, trials in life. And something's got to, I got to tell you, there is more tears available to the thanksgiving at Jesus' feet than any tear of the torment the enemy has brought into your life. And it's time that we take the tears that have been shed in our cheeks and bring them into a place of tears of joy, tears of thanksgiving. It's okay to talk a little bit about Thanksgiving even though it's not November, right? Yeah. It's in this place that, that these tears that are being collected now, I'm sure if she was a sinner woman and her reputation was that big, she had shed tears before of the bad things that have happened to her in her life. And in this moment, these are not tears of pain or sorrow, but those are those crocodiles, hot tears of thanksgiving, wiping and running and washing his feet. She didn't need a bowl of water. She didn't even need tradition. Out of her heart, she brought forth this offering. And that question of what causes a person to take the treasure that they have, first to recognize it and not think I don't have enough or what I have is not adequate. It's not like Jesus' favorite thing was perfume and and uh, that we know of. Maybe she didn't think she had some of his greatest things he wanted, but she had something. <laughs> Maybe she didn't have the best gift that the preacher on TV was asking for. Maybe she didn't have the best gift on, on, on all these different things, but she did have a gift, and she brings her gift unto Jesus. What causes someone to begin to go through their life and look for the treasure that they have and bring it to the feet of Jesus. Because whether it's a widow's mite or whether it's a boy's lunch, a couple of pieces of fish and bread isn't that valuable unless you're really hungry. And the boy's lunch wasn't something that you would think was so incredible but thousands of years later, we talk about it. Matter of fact, he even goes on to say in these moments in the Gospels that, that in a place of love that was brought to Jesus of, of the washing of his feet, that where the Gospel is spread, that the story of this woman will be told. Wow. <laughs> what did she have to do? I bet you one thing is, I know this one thing is for sure. She's up in eternity right now going, I am so thankful that I took my treasure and I brought it to Jesus. How many treasures have been collecting dust far too long waiting? You know, you have those people dealing with inadequacy. You know, they have this thought like, when I win the lottery, oh, I'm going to give the church a big check. 
when I win the lottery, then I'm going to give into the kingdom of God. I'm going to help out the, these people in need over here. And, and, and that's ridiculous, right? We can kind of see that. It's not when our ship comes in that we're able to give, but he looks on what we have, and we're responsible to what we've been given. What are we doing with the treasure that's in our hands? This woman brings it to Jesus. And you got these other guys, even following Jesus, that are offended at the gift. And they get lumped in throughout wherever the gospel is told for all eternity that they were there mad at the one that was doing the right thing. Was the woman perfect? No, she was a sinner. But she was able to bring a perfect praise. Huh. Something that matters to God. Something that matters that he lumps it in and says, this woman's story needs to be told. It will not be forgotten of her. And there's other forms in John and other places. But, but back to in this one, though, in this moment, she comes in, she breaks it, she brings her treasure. What brings a woman to taking something that she's earned, however she got it, and she's bringing it and breaking it open for Jesus. What would cause us to take the treasures of our heart, the talents and gifts that he's placed with inside of us, and bring them to Jesus? What's it going to take for us to take our treasure and bring it to his feet? In her case, she was forgiven much, so she loved much. Ironically, though, even in this definition of the parable, she was already forgiven, and yet he does say, go, you are forgiven, go in peace. And if that didn't make the Pharisee upset before, <laughs> what, well, who are you to forgive someone of their sins? She comes in already forgiven, grateful, and saying thank you to Jesus. Never did she know what was going to happen. She wasn't doing it to get a pat on the back, and that's, that's, that's a whole other message right there. To be able to give the treasure when nobody's watching, like a David as a shepherd boy dancing in the back fields when nobody's watching. Can you give the treasure when no one sees it and pats you on the back? What causes us to recognize our treasure and give it to the one who deserves it. As the worship team comes, His mercy and His grace to draw us and bring us into a place where others may seem like it's not much, and maybe you don't think it's that much. But I'm going to start with giving you what I've got, God. Whether it's a widow's mite, whether it's a boy's lunch, regardless of the amount but God, this is my treasure. I'm been trying to work with some of the soccer players, the, you guys are like the professional football players in Brazil, that that are Christian. Because here they have a gift and a talent, which is soccer. But be able to take the gift and that talent and use it for the kingdom of God. as Kaka would score and make his goals and lift his shirt and say, I belong to Jesus. God, you've given me this gift and you've given me this talent and if I can use it to bring this treasure to you, maybe you can't sing like Desiree, maybe you can't play the guitar like Pastor Jeff, You've got a treasure. And regardless of how insignificant you've given it credit for, the moment you place your treasure at his feet, he multiplies it and makes it the best thing in the room. The best thing in the room. But as long as we keep it, it stays insignificant. Sure, they could cheer your name, but they'll forget your name before too long. They'll be the next soccer star, the next team. When it comes to football, do you even know who won the World Series a couple, or baseball, the World Series a couple years ago? Well, we know it wasn't the Cardinals, but that's another thing. But, but do you know who won the, the, the championship 
the Stanley Cup a couple years ago? How about the Super Bowl three years ago? It's really not that big of a deal, is it? But if you have that moment of taking that treasure and giving it to Jesus, everybody's standing. Lord, that all of us here would be able to recognize the treasure that you've deposited, treasure within earthen vessels, oh God. Lord, that we would bring this ability, this treasure that you've entrusted us with. And God, even if we don't exactly know what to do with it, God, even if it's smiling at the greeter at the door, whether it's passing and ushering, whether it's taking bounce houses out into the neighborhoods, God, we can do that. We, we can take this treasure. And we bring the treasure, Lord, as they recognize the treasures of their hearts, of their lives, and also bringing the shift in our heart of taking the treasure and bringing it to your feet, oh God. That we live a life of an eternal difference, a life that makes heaven smile, a life, oh God, of where our treasure is, as we bring to you. If you're here this morning and you want to make a commitment to Jesus, maybe it's the first time in your life, maybe it's a rededication, a refreshing, a recommitment, or maybe you need healing in your body. If you have sickness in your body, or you have a prayer request for your family, we just want to invite you to step out of your seats, make your way up here to this altar, and as the ministry team and the pastors, we're going to be up here, we're going to be watching heaven move on your behalf.